I'm Sasha Stefanovic from Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Brags in the Stands. versus IU tomorrow at Mackey. That's how we're going to end the season. And we got a special guest, Isaac Haas, coming on in just a few minutes. Let's go. new tradition last year where they celebrate their wins the correct way. Bottle and fill the ESPN 1000. Don't miss it.
you are ridiculous. <laughs> regular season Big Ten title was decided in Madison, Wisconsin on Tuesday night. Unfortunately, the Boilers, uh, with an epic comeback down 11 in the second half, fell just short off two banked shots to win the game for Wisconsin. Um, you know, did everything they could this season to win the Big Ten. Obviously had some tough moments. You know, they didn't do themselves any favors necessarily in their losses. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of fortuitous uh, plays for the opposition when you consider uh, the Rutgers and Ron Harper Jr. hitting a half-court bank shot to win the game earlier this season and then to to finish the Big Ten title once and for all, Wisconsin having their own bank shot luck of their own. But not to take anything away from Wisconsin, they certainly battled all season long to earn that title. And now we move on, you know, after tomorrow's big IU versus Purdue showdown at Mackey Arena. For senior night, uh, senior day, however you want to say it, um, you know, we move on to the tournament and see if Purdue can can uh, do some things that are, you know, some goals that are still in front of them. Yes, that's a goal that didn't get attained. That's disappointing without question. No way to sugarcoat it. But there's still some bigger goals they can still achieve. So without further ado, we're going to bring on our special guest for the night. Uh, we've been talking about it all day. Isaac. The show Isaac, can you hear us? Hey, how are you, man? Great, how are you? I appreciate you coming on. You know, uh, we've been doing some scheduling, you know, to try to figure out when we get you on. You're, you're 13 hours ahead, you're in China, uh, playing professional basketball. What's life like over there? Well, right now, it's just, um, it's just life in a bubble, right? Like, uh, the whole country's closed off, so no, nobody's really. Uh, getting in or out very easily. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're, we're in the bubble. Uh, they set up hotels for us and we just kind of um, live our life really. I mean, like we just play games and have a day off then play another game, have a day off, play another game, you know, so just regular basketball stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I recently watched the Stefan Marbury uh, documentary and when he went over there, how big of a star he became. What is it like for you, you know, uh, when you're walking down the street? You know, I know ba basketball is a huge part of the culture in China. What's the fanfare like for you over there? Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty big, honestly. Like, um, so the Chinese agency that I'm with, they um, they set up like this TikTok thing. Uh, apparently, it's, it's pretty big over here. And um, they just... Uh, post a lot of content on there and apparently there's a lot of following. Uh, I, I'm not really big into social media that much. Um, so, I, you know, I'll let them handle that. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it's pretty cool. Like when I'm walking down the street, like a lot of people want to take pictures and stuff like that. Obviously they're amazed by how tall I am. Uh, but that's just about everywhere I get, uh, <laughs> just especially over here because everybody's a lot shorter than back in the States. Sure. Sure. Uh, well, that's that's really awesome. You know, it's a, definitely a great uh, culture for basketball. I know how much they they worship the game of basketball. Like I said, Stephon Marbury had like a whole second career there, you know, um, and I didn't even realize like how much bigger he was over there than he even was in the United States. So it just goes to show you how global this sport is. Uh, 
you know, obviously we brought you on today because, you know, obviously your Purdue roots and this is a, uh, we do a lot of Purdue basketball coverage here at Braggs in the stands along with a lot of Chicago sports stuff. And, you know, maybe before we get into what's going on with the Purdue Boilermakers right now, talk about what it was like for you going into your recruitment to be at Purdue with Matt Painter, because, you know, you look at Zach Eady, yourself, Matt Harms, uh, you know, all, uh, and now they've got another guy coming in here, uh, Will Berg, you know, uh, coming from Sweden. You know, it, it seems like it's become like a big man factory here at, uh, you know, big man you almost at Purdue University. What? Why is it that Matt Painter can attract you guys as recruits and maybe speak about your your personal experience as far as getting recruited to Purdue University? Well, I would just say first that he obviously gets uh, those those guys that are not exactly, you know, your Kentucky or your Duke guys, right? But they're they're the guys that that come in, they work hard, and they they show up every day, right? And they're they're they keep it simple, and um, that's what he likes, right? So uh, he's able to get these guys, um, you know, when they're unranked, like Zach Eady or or me or or you know, anybody else that, you know, he finds a William Berg, I guess, uh, from, I, I can't remember where he's from, but, um, I think he's from Sweden. I, he's from Sweden. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, Matt Harms, he, you know, he finds these guys out of the woodworks, right? right? But, um, they always come in, they work hard and they do their job. That's just the culture there. And, uh, that's the culture that I, I believe that, you know, Rayfield Davis started and then, you know, us four, uh, Vince, Dakota, uh, PJ and me, we all, uh, kind of established that culture. And uh, I feel like from there on out, it's just become handed down and handed down. Um, so, you know, holding each other accountable has just uh, been a huge part of why Purdue has been so successful. Um, and, and because when you have a team led organization and not a coach led organization, uh, it's a lot easier on the coaches. You know, all they got to worry about is the scout report, making sure that we're doing the right things. Right. And then in terms of discipline, we discipline ourselves, you know, so I, I think it, it really helps. Um, now, as for as for me, recruiting wise, um, it was just a. It was a matter of I had I had a lot of schools uh, that, that reached out to me. Um, after a couple AAU tournaments in the UIBL tournaments that I was in when I played for Alabama Challenge, and I remember that I was um, I was warming up one day and I saw Coach Painter was, was staring at me, and he told me this later, but he said that he pointed at me, and said, "I want that guy." So, um, you know, later on down the road, once I had narrowed things down and I had Purdue on my list, I had originally committed to Wake Forest. Um, However, after that, I realized that that was not the right choice. I backed out of that. And Coach Painter came down and visited me uh, in Alabama. And, you know, he, he just never lied to me. He always told me the truth. And that's all, always what I wanted was somebody that was just going to tell me the truth from the moment that, that I met them until I graduated. And um, that's exactly what it did. And that's why I loved it there. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Matt Painter watching him, obviously, uh, maybe, you know, I mentioned this to you offline, but, you know, being a friend of Sasha's and watching his development throughout these years and, and just seeing how he takes each player individually and makes them so much better. I don't think there's too many coaches that are better than him in the country. So I have the utmost respect for him. Now you mentioned, you know, the culture that you and Rafe, uh, Rafael Davis and, and, and Dakota Mathias built, you know, watching this season, something that's really stood out to me, you know, the difference between the first year Sasha was here as a freshman and now is every time Purdue loses, you know, it's not fun, but I'm just shocked to watch these schools storm the court, a team like Michigan, who's been to, so many, you know, final fours and national championship games, you know, uh, you know, IU, their hated rival. And, you know, you talk about the big brother and little brother, you know, uh, you know, uh, things they like to say back and forth towards each other. Well, IU takes down Purdue and, and there they go. They're, char they're storming the court 
The Rutgers stormed the court. And, and even Wisconsin, I understand they won the Big Ten title. They also start. It's like that to me is saved for a team like Duke and North Carolina, those blue bloods of the country. When you beat a team, it's like it's like your Super Bowl. What does it mean to you to see where the program is at from where you guys started this as the culture, as you mentioned, and now to see the program get to number one for the first time, number one in the country for the first time in program history, and now having your rival schools that have uh, a, a tremendous tradition and history of their own storming the court in honor of beating the Purdue Boilermakers. Does that, does that strike you in any way? Oh, I mean, who couldn't be proud of that, right? Like who, who wouldn't sit here and be like, Oh yeah. Like I, I'm indirectly a part of that. You know, like I, like we, we all uh, are, you know, like uh, Dakota Vince, PJ, everybody who's a part of that program, uh, for Rayfell, you know, anybody who was a part of that program, especially like, you know, brief flashback, but before, you know, us four came in, like uh, Purdue, I believe, was either last or next to last in the Big Ten. Um, but whenever we came in, you know, like we, we listened to Rayfell and Rayfell guided us. And then uh, we obviously had the great help of Josh Bonital uh, to help uh, mentor us as well. And uh, we we all just kind of changed the culture. We just came in, started early, and left late, you know, and that's just how it was. Um, and we just wanted to see more out of ourselves. And lo and behold, you know, now you see the results of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the results are tremendous. And now you're really starting to see Painter recruit. Every year it seems like his recruiting classes are getting even better and better. They've got a couple kids. I mean – Roosevelt Colvin's kid, Miles Colvin, is coming in in a couple years. He looks like a dynamo. I mean, he's only a junior, and if you watch his highlight reveal that his dad shares on Twitter all the time, it's it's shocking to watch. And and you see Jade Nivey this season. You know, uh, not maybe your prototypical Purdue type of player. You know, uh, um, it, you just see where that evolution of where this program is going. And, and Purdue, you know, obviously Matt Painter is always going to keep his foundation of what Purdue is. But I do think that they are starting to evolve into more of an offensively focused team. You know, I mean, when you were here and I've heard from Bobby Riddell, you know, he's been on this show many, many times, talk about you guys would barely practice offense. It was always practicing defense. And now it seems like there is more of an offensive lean uh, to what Purdue is trying to do um, if, in the games that you've watched this year, you know, what do you, what, what do you think of the defense? Because obviously that's, that's kind of the thing that's holding them back. I mean, it's almost silly to say when you talk about a team that only has six losses, but you know, the thing that, that, you know, the, the Ken Palm ratings and what Matt Painter says after the game is the defense is holding them back. And now you, you obviously practiced, and, and, and learned everything that Matt Painter wanted to teach as far as philosophy on the defensive end. What are you seeing that's holding them back? Because obviously the game is probably similar to how you guys were played, you know, as far as teams trying to attack you off the pick and roll and try to take advantage in different ways. Is Has anything stood out to you as far as what maybe Purdue could do a little better to, 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 to get a little better on defense? So I'll go back to what you were saying before. Um, <clears throat> offensively, yes, I would say Purdue is making a better trend in that aspect. Um, I think that we we are focusing more on that. However, defense is always going to be a staple of what we do at Purdue. There is, I guarantee you, they are not going through practice right now and not working on defense every day. Yeah. Um, if it's, if it's the, uh, the Purdue, I remember, I guarantee you they're over there working on defensive drills, slides, any rebounding, any of the above, uh, to ensure that they get stops. Um, now whether or not they actually, you know, commit and do those things in the game that, that comes down to personal and team commitment. Right. Um, so that, I think that's part of the reason what, what made, you know, my four years, so special is that we really focused on, you know, 
taking pride in our defense. And we, I mean, shoot, you saw Dakota Mathias turn from somebody who was a liability as freshman year on defense to just an unbelievable defender. Like, you know, quick right. hands was, was just absolutely just terrorizing these guys. Like, and, and that comes after, you know, the era of Rafael Davis. Right. So like, and it's just been handed down and handed down. There's always been that one defensive guy. The one guy who's impressed me the most defensively is Mason Gillis this year. Absolutely. That dude is just laying it all on the line. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what kind of voice he has in the locker room. I'm not there. But I would say that that dude needs to have a voice. And he needs to be either setting by example or or, or speaking up. And, and hopefully, uh, I would say it's setting by example because that speaks way louder than words. Sure. Yeah, no, without question, Mason is certainly one of their defensive and, and effort leaders on the team. Um, you know, Eric Hunter also, I think, comes to mind. Really uh, battled yeah, Eric his, Hunter, yes. yeah, he's, Even he's, Eric Hunter, yeah. Yeah, he's battled his butt off because at the start of the year, he, he didn't have the starting job. You know, maybe was a little down on himself from that and, and worked his way back into the starting lineup. And, and even in the Wisconsin game, you know, you mentioned you didn't get a chance to watch it, but – him and Ethan Morton, who I really think is starting to to uh, blossom here at Purdue University, both those guys were really, really, really good defensively in in the Wisconsin loss. So I do think there's a bit of a silver lining, and and hopefully they can take that and carry it over into uh, the March Madness tournament, the Big Ten tournament here coming up. You know, obviously, you know your expertise, you know, as far as how to play as a big at Purdue is certainly something I really wanted to pick your brain about because, you know, Purdue in a very rare situation right now has two guys that are just unbelievable talents. Uh, Travion Williams, a senior tomorrow is his senior day. Um, and, and Zach Eady, who only as a sophomore is becoming one of the more dominant players in college basketball, you know, talk about, what you've seen from them and, and what impresses you most about those guys? Well, I would say Trevion Williams from the beginning uh, when he first came to Purdue, I knew he was going to be special. Uh, he kind of reminds me of Caleb Swanigan in, a, in, in ways, but he's, but he's actually more skilled. Um, I think he's got, he's got the soft touch. He's got the jump shots. He, he, uh, he's got the feet work. He's, he's an unbelievable player, right? Um, I would also say that, you know, his commitment and drive to 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 really play hard every game, I think, is something that 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 doesn't get talked about enough, right? Like it, it, it that dude goes out there and lays it on the line like every day, right? So, I think people need to really pay attention to that and and appreciate it before it's gone. You know, obviously, it's a senior day coming up. That's going to be a special moment for him and his family, and for Purdue uh, family overall, right? And I think Absolutely. that needs to be that really recognized and respected for him. Um, for Zach Eady, I would say, man, that dude is a monster. Um, I would love the chance to be able to go back to Purdue and, and, and scrimmage against him and just kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, teach him some things as well as, you know, just play against him, right? Like, uh, I just – I really enjoy that big on big, you know, kind of grind that battle, right? Um, dude's a great player. Uh, he's going to be great. He just needs to keep working. He's in great hands to be great. Um, uh, there's really nothing else to say about that. Yeah, uh, certainly been amazing. Have you had a chance? Did you see the dunk by Travion Williams at Northwestern like two weeks ago? Did you have a chance? I sure to did, and I was showing it to some of the some of my Chinese teammates, and they were like, "Whoa!" <laughs> Could you they, believe they, they called an offensive foul on that? I mean, listen. All I can say is human error because <laughs> that's that is uh, as I'm watching it right now. That is just disgusting, and there, in no way whatsoever is that an offensive. That's just that's either a no call or an and one. It's just that's just how it is. Um, Unbelievable! If you're not display willing to get high enough to get it, uh, <laughs> or if you're not willing to box out, you pay the price. You can't reward the other team for doing that. So I completely agree, and and like you said, a guy that has worked his tail off. I mean, when he came here, obviously it's well documented that he was uh, overweight and had a lot of pounds to lose 
when he first came into Purdue. Uh, you maybe lose the baby fat or whatever. I'm one to talk, uh, but he had he had some baby fat to lose. And uh, you know, I can remember because he came in with Sasha how much weight he lost in just those first few months with Purdue to get into playing shape. Now, fast forward to his senior year, and he's jumping over guys, you know, that are just as big as him in that fashion. It was truly unbelievable to see, um, you know, and then, of course, like you talked about with Zach Eady, uh, to me, this guy, I just, you know, I'm just so impressed. You know, obviously, another well-documented thing about him is he just started playing basketball. I mean, he, he was a hockey player until his sophomore year. And I always hear from Matt Painter how much of a sponge of information that he is. You know, he, he Painter tells him what to do, and he does it because, you know, he only knows the game through Purdue. He, he didn't have all these coaches as a young kid to, to learn from different ways. He only knows the Purdue way, and I think Matt really enjoys that part of him. And obviously, you know, he's able to learn it and execute it. And, you know, it's just – you know, I think that he'll have another year here next year. You know, I, do, is there any part of his game that you think he needs to improve on? You know, I do think the NBA is in his future, but, do you know, is there anything that he can improve on at this level to help his status, you know, draft status or, or potential of making it to the league? Well, um, with the way the NBA is today, I would say that obviously there's always something you can work on. Um, Zach Eady is is an unbelievable player. Um, sometimes just being dominant shows a lot. Um, so if he's able to just come in and do this consistently night in, night out, that speaks volumes, right? Um, the big thing I would work on is work on isolation game because when you get into the NBA – um, you are in a situation where you're either just picking and rolling and you're catching lobs or you're picking and rolling, you're not getting the ball and you just got to work on rebounding. Um, obviously, he's a great rebounder. Nobody's saying that he isn't. I'm just saying that it gets a lot harder at that level, at the professional level to rebound. Uh, you got to be able to step up and just, just do it. And you got to just find a way, right? So... Uh, for him, I would say isolation game, uh, be able to score one-on-one, -on -one, you know, catch it outside the block and be able to score if you do uh, get that opportunity. Um, I would say that, you know, being a defensive anchor, being able to move your feet on the perimeter, that's a huge issue uh, for big guys nowadays that aren't, you know, these skilled, you know, Anthony Davises or or Carl uh, Anthony Towns, right? If you're not out there dribbling the ball and shooting threes like that, you gotta be, you gotta be like a Rudy Gobert. You gotta be like a shot blocker. You gotta be somebody that that if you get switched off on, you make the the shot as tough as possible for the guards, right? You play percentages. You have to be able to be smart as well as um, be able to move your feet. Um, so so footwork is a big thing, I would say for him. The isolation game, footwork, uh, obviously, rebounding is always something you can improve on. Uh, and for anyone at any level. Um, so, you know, obviously there, you could sit here and go all day. Uh, you could say, hey, listen, if you develop a shot, you have you can go higher, you know. Right. But, um, yeah, I've you know, seen some fans system. message me and say, well, I, if I were him, I'd work on a three-point shot all year and he'll be a top pick. I'm like, I don't, he's not going to be shooting threes, you know. Like, that's not who he is, you know. And that's – no, I hey – as great as he is as a free throw shooter, and that's something that has been one of the most impressive things to me is his touch at the free throw line. You know, for a guy that big, it's always not always that easy as we've seen with other big men in, you know, in the past. But at the same time, he's not going to be shooting threes. I'm fairly confident saying, not trying to hold anything back. I think the kid's capable of anything. But, um, you know, the one thing that in college that's really holding him back is something you touched on on Twitter. You, you you put out a post because you had a lot of people reaching out to you. Uh, you know, here it is. It's kind of, you know, to paraphrase, and if you want, for you fans that didn't get to see it, uh, Isaac posted this on Twitter. But to paraphrase, it was basically to say that the Big Ten refs don't fairly call 
guys like you and Zach and Kofi Coburn, you know, fairly that they that you they almost try to even the game out because of how much of an advantage you guys are down low and how they don't really understand how to ref you guys, so they just try to compensate by calling the ticky tack stuff. But at the same time, in your post, you said Matt Painter said, "Hey, this game isn't for the weak," and he was in that famous clip speaking to you about that because, you know, you guys get frustrated. I was at the Michigan State game and Zach Eady's got a knee so far up his butt that, you know, the guy could have, you know, filed charges. But instead, Zach turns because he gets frustrated and gets called for an offensive foul when the foul should have absolutely been on Michigan State. And Painter said after the game, he told him, he's like, hey, man, you you can't give them something to give – to call the foul on you, you know, state your case and and don't show your frustration. How does Zach learn to stay out of foul trouble or is it even possible with his size? Because when he turns, even if he's not necessarily flailing his elbows, which he does from time to time, I'm not a completely biased fan. He does stick the chicken wing out from time to time, but other times it's just because he's so much taller than the guy guarding him that his arm just happens to come in to above the shoulder area. You know, Travion's not going to be here next year, so he's not going to have that fail safe behind him if he is indeed in foul trouble. And for Zach to have an amazing year like we all know he probably will have next year, how can he maximize that by staying out of foul trouble uh, next season? Well, um, to go back to your original paraphrase uh, of what I said, so I wasn't saying that the the Big Ten reps are incapable of calling it. I was saying that it it's more of they they do try to even it out sometimes, or they're subconsciously doing that because they're just trying to give the little guy a chance. But I think that it's it's really more of a a realization for them that they have to realize that, hey, he's literally brought here for the advantage that he brings in the post. If other teams are not willing to bring a big guy, they should be punished. And so I I just want to make that very clear. that I'm not saying that the refs are incapable. They're very good refs. I know that Purdue fans are going to complain and they're going to (laughs) say that. Oh, we're good at complaining about the refs. Bo makes bad calls. (laughs) Bo makes mistakes. Gene makes mistakes. They all make mistakes. Okay. Like they're human, right? The only way you can sit here and just say that, that every ref should call everything perfect is in March Madness. Right. But even then they make mistakes. It happens, right? Like they're on the top of their game going into March Madness. They are, they are calling everything or they're letting things go. Um, that are not relevant to the game. They're going to let you play in March Madness more. Um, Big Ten, I would say, like, they do let you play, but sometimes you get those games where it's everything's ticky-tacky because they got cracked down on by the committee, and the committee saying, you know, you have to watch this, and now they're calling everything. Um, you know, and that's just the nature of the game. But um, for Zach Eady, I would just say, you know, as I said in the post, you just got to find a way, man. There's just, there's no, there's no, there's no right answer, right? Like there's no saying, hey, listen, if you do it this way, this is going to work. If you do it that way, the way that I just told you, they might shift their defense and you might catch an elbow to their, to their chin again, and you might get an offensive foul and you're going to look at me crazy. There's no way for me to sit here and go through every scenario because right. every scenario in basketball is different. So uh, at the end of the day, it's just finding a way, finding different ways to get open, to create angles, to to create your own angles um, with your body. And it really just comes down to feet work, right? Like feet work is everything. If you can, if you have good feet, you can create your own space. You can create angles. You can do everything you need to in order to continue to be dominant. Um, everybody gets frustrated. Everybody gets times where they they let their emotions get the best of them, especially in college. Come on. Right. Especially in college. That's like the most volatile time of your life, right? Like you're yeah. you're really figuring out who you are as a person. 
uh, you know, really kind of living on your own in, in, in a professional situation where you're you're having to commit to a team with a bunch of guys that that you didn't grow up with, right? Sure. So it's just it's it's an emotional time for all those guys for those four years. It, it makes sense, you know, for them to get frustrated. Um, just try your best to keep it under wraps. That's all yeah. you can say. Yeah, I think that fans forget that. Even myself at times, you know, you have to remind yourself with a guy like Jaden Ivey, who is, to me, a very emotion, plays off of emotion. Sometimes it can be for better or worse. Zach, certainly, I felt like the more angry he gets, the better he gets, but then sometimes that anger can get the best of you and you overplay something and, like you said, get called for an offensive foul. But as you mentioned, you know, you have to remind yourself, they're kids in a lot of ways, even though they're, you know, legally adults, you're still trying to mature and everyone matures at their own rate. And, you know, none of these players are a finished product in their years at Purdue. So, you know, I think fans sometimes have to take a step back, even though everyone wants the golden goose and the national championship and the final four appearance, and you need these players to mature as fast as they can to get there potentially that, you know, each player is going to mature at their own rate. You know, you also mentioned in that, in that post you put that, Matt Painter sends in a video to for all the fouls they feel like didn't get called. You know, how, how, you know, like for me when I watch that, he's fouled literally. I feel like almost on almost on every play. I mean, especially when they're throwing the 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 pass inside to him and they're pushing at the lower part of his back as far as they can to get him as far away from the basket. That's a foul every single time for a, any average basketball player with a, you know, a normal size, quote unquote, you know, how frustrating can that get? And I'm sure you experience this, this at, too, getting fouled on almost every play, but only getting maybe one every 10 calls. How frustrating can that be for you and, and mentally fatiguing? Well, I mean, obviously it's frustrating, right? Like if you know, it's a foul and, and um, and, you know, they just allow it to keep happening. Obviously, it's frustrating, right? But there's things you can do. Uh, I'm not going to reveal all my secrets, but there's things you can do to make sure you get those calls. Um, at the same time, uh, that it doesn't get better. It doesn't. Not at this level. Um, and, that, and, you know, I'm in China, right? And so it, it's a little bit more biased against imports. So, obviously, we're not getting – any calls across the board, not just pushing <laughs> in the back. So um, it's just, I mean, it just doesn't change, man. It's, it's not going to get better. So you just got to, like I said, find a way, man. Just find a way. You, uh, he'll, he'll that's do why, it. I mean, I, that's you know, why he's I'm... young. He's still got a, he's still got a lot of time to improve and grow. Like he'll, he'll, he'll find his way. No problem. That's why I miss those high school days of, of watching the teams I support, you know, or, you know, I still go to high school games, but like, when Sasha was in high school playing at Crown Point, we'd be sitting right on the sidelines and we'd be working the refs up and down the court just as much as the coaches on the other side. You know, you need somebody to have their back. Obviously, the fans are always going to be yelling something. At Mackey, it gets so loud, the refs can barely hear anything, let alone a lowly fan screaming and hooting and hollering. But, um, you know, I definitely think, you know, sometimes a, a, a quiet reminder as you're walking off the court in a timeout, tell them what the, the guy is doing to you certainly can go a long way. We got a comment in the chat from our live viewers. Uh, Brian du Duggar uh, is asking, don't you think the refs need to be reminded of Edie's cylinder it is much larger and he deserves his space? A hundred percent. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, that's just the nature of basketball is the cylinders from your shoulders down to your uh, feet at shoulder width. Right. Um, Yes, it does need to be respected, and it does need to be called. Is it going to? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you're not going to see that much of a change. But to go back to what you said earlier, uh, Matt Painter is sending in those clips. Every time you see that he's getting pushed off the block and you know that that's a foul or you see them pulling out of shoulders or all the above, I guarantee you Coach Painter is clipping that, sending it in, and saying, what the heck, man? Like, we just talked about this, you know, two days ago, three days ago. Why are we having this discussion again? You know, and then you'll get those games where they call them, and then, you know, you'll get another game where they 
lack on it again because they felt like they made up for it. And then he's having to send it in again. And, you know, it's just, it's never a consistent uh, calling structure that that's being made. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's tough. You know, it's, it's not easy. It'd, it'd be a free throw contest all day long if they called every play, but you know, as a bears fan that I always complain back, you know, in the, you know, like five, 10 years ago, they had these, secondary corners that would literally just hold the receivers on every play because they knew that they ain't going to call it on every play. So it's, it's a interesting strategy and and some teams get away with it and others don't, but hopefully uh, Zach and and Purdue can get some better luck as far as some calls in the, in the, in the tournaments coming up. You know, I, I do find it funny watching Matt. I watch Matt Painter almost as much as I watch the ball on the court when I'm at the games because he tells you a lot with his mannerisms and what he's saying to either the players or the assistant coaches or even the refs as they're coming down the court. And I always laugh at the beginning of the games because uh, when, when a call isn't made for Zach or other players, he just puts his hands up and he kind he has this way of like um, saying something to the ref without screaming it, you know, like Brad Underwood is screaming at the refs all game long and other coaches are just going on a complete tirade. And Matt, you know, he's been here so long. Maybe he was different as a younger coach, but now he's he's just very stoic. But he gets his point across in a in a nonverbal way, and I I appreciate that. But you know exactly what he's getting at. And I always tell the people sitting next to me, I'm like, oh, he's gonna get that call eventually because Matt's working the refs right now. So it is interesting to see. Um, you know, and, and, you know, to, to one more thing from that post is. You know, you're obviously known for the hook and hold call. Some call it the Isaac Haas rule. And, you know, Purdue in the last couple games has had some hook and hold situations. And at the end of the Michigan State game, tied with a minute to go, Zach Eady gets uh, – gets he was hook and held. And they called I saw it that a, play. Yeah, and they called it a foul on Zach. They, you know, the coaches, from what I understand, I guess – Everything with the commotion didn't see it enough to 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 you know um, encourage the refs to review it, and then all of a sudden free throws on the other end. Purdue eventually goes on to lose, and then in the Wisconsin game there was another potential hook and hold, and I thought they were going to call it that time between Tyler Wall and I believe Mason Gillis, and they they reviewed it and did not give it to him. Um, and you mentioned, and it surprised me in the post. You said you believe the call should just go away. Explain that a little bit, because I know that is a big frustration for fans, especially Purdue fans. I mean, in my, I'm not, listen, I watched the Michigan State game. I'll start with that. That if you're going to have the rule, you got to call it. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just my opinion that I don't know how you can, uh, not, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how the referees can't see that and and wonder. Wait a second. Should we review that? Maybe it's heat of the moment. Maybe they saw the end of it. I, I'm not sure what they saw. I'm not there in the moment. I'm not sure what any of the referees where their their eyes were directed. Um. But in, in my opinion, they should have called that a, a hook and hold if you're going to have the rule. Now, I didn't see the Wisconsin one. I don't know about that. I didn't, I didn't. I don't know anything about that. I didn't see the play. But in my opinion, that rule is just beyond necessary. It's it's just so it, or not. Sorry, not necessary. It's beyond. Uh, I don't want to sound vulgar here. It's just not. It's just not a good rule. <laughs> it's just not a good rule. It needs to go away. Uh, I'm sorry. You're you're you're. The game of basketball has changed so much, and there's so many calls being made now that it, it it's just you're you're limiting uh, the game. Um, like high school doesn't have that rule. Professional, sure enough, does not have that rule. Like, why do we have to have it in college, right? Like, sure. why why does this have to be something that is special for this one? period of basketball like what, what like what point are you trying to serve by by having this now it's called you know in in mentions that have 
people have reached out to me, the Isaac Hotz rule, right? Right. I don't know if that's, you know, because of my incident, but the, it's a freak accident. Like, why why change the game of basketball after something when my career's already over? Like, like you know what I'm saying? Yeah. First of all, I don't think you should change the game for one person anyways. That's just that's just my opinion. I don't think that that's something you should do. But if you're going to do it, you have to enforce it to a degree that that makes it uh, viable for every team, not just uh, I don't know. I, I get I get scrambled about it because it just doesn't make sense to me. Like I, I don't understand. I, think I understand how, what you're how trying a freak to say. Situation could happen to me that 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 would cause this rule. Now I said in the post, I, I, I don't know if that's something they've been considering long before that. Um, you never really know unless you're on the committee, maybe you get a committee member to stand out and say, Hey, listen, we've been thinking about this rule for several years now. And then this was just the final straw that would make more sense. But from what we've seen, it, it mean, it literally happened right after my injury and, they made a direct ref uh, made a direct reference right right so like why <laughs> you i know? think i can understand what your point is maybe it's taking away from battle the battles down low and of course and that's if, basketball like right. that's the game of basketball you you have to thrive on the fight down there mm -hmm. and you have to find ways to fight that's what makes rebounds so special and they have flagrant fouls in place if a guy takes a dude's arm and throws him over you can call a flagrant foul because it's a non-basketball play you know so I, I can see your point there you know it becomes like a you know sometimes at the end of these games there's like 20 reviews in the last five minutes and the game takes just as long as the first 35 minutes so I, I can see your point there but if as you said if the if the rule is in place they should call it by the book in a lot of ways. Now in the Wisconsin game, I watched the ref explain it to Matt and he said the guy already, you know, Mason had already brought his arm over voluntarily and that's why they got tangled up and that's why they didn't call it. So I, you know, as, as much as I wanted the call, I guess I can see their point. Um, you know, I agree the Michigan state call should have been called because they're doing everything they can to stop Zach Eady from getting his hands on rebounds. But I'm also, uh, I'm fair to say that I'm biased. Um, we, we have, uh, only a few more short minutes with you. I know you have, uh, more, um, uh, um, you know, responsibilities, you know, for your own, uh, work ahead, you know, different things and workouts and, and things of that nature. So I don't want to keep you too much longer. We have a, 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 a comment in the chat from Gary Richard, uh, Isaac, he says, Isaac, it's great to hear you and see you so well. Thank you for all your hard work when you were at Purdue. I wish nothing but success for you. You know, um, tomorrow is senior day for the Purdue Boilermakers. You know, you once had your senior day, you know, and, and tomorrow it's for Travion Williams, Sasha Stefanovic, uh, you know, Eric Hunter and Jared Wolburn. Um, talk about what that day meant to you, the emotions that went through, you know, what the Purdue fan base and the university mean to you, you know, maybe as a whole, you know, you know, encompassing little answer here, but what did that day overall, your senior day mean for you? Uh, well, first I want to say, you know, thank you, Richard, for the well wishes. That means a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I really do appreciate the Purdue fan base as much as, you know, the, the coaches and the staff that were with me every day. Um, you know, that you guys are the reason why we continue to play, if not for ourselves, right? Like we do it for the, 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 the pride that we have for the school and, and, and for you guys to have entertainment as well. So just remember that we appreciate fans literally just as much as everything else that we have at Purdue. Um, you guys are an extension of the family and we, we love it. So, so thank you so much for the well wishes, man. Um, my senior night, special moment. Um, not really much to say. I, I, I believe I cried. So that, that just shows how much it means to me. I don't, I don't cry. So, uh, 
I mean, that's it. Just I just remember all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the program. Um, you know, when you commit to something so so heavily, and then you it, it just all of a sudden comes to an end, and that's going to be the last game you ever play in front of all those fans. Um, you know, it, it just it, it hits hard when you get that highlight video and you get the music and then you got all these people standing ovation. Like it just oh, it's heavy, man. It, it hits heavy, and I'm starting to like think was, about it again. Like I was gonna say, if we get if we get you to cry on Bragg's in the stands, that'll be a that would be a first on here, but. I can understand the emotions. I'm serious, man. You can ask my family. I don't cry. So like I do not cry. So when when you guys caught a moment for me that was um pretty rare. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine I'm a very emotional person. Uh as I've said before, I'm good friends with Sasha Stefanovich and his family. Uh we we're both from the same hometown of Crown Point, Indiana. Watched every dribble of his in high school. Uh, had his teammate was a good friend of mine in high school. His teammate was a good friend of mine growing up. And that's how I got to know Sasha. And it was just so much fun to watch him. The, the, the crown point years were some of my favorite and most pure four years of watching any, following any team from professional sports on. And that includes, you know, the Cubs winning the world series or any of them. And his senior year, it's like, hits you like a ton of bricks. You're having, so much fun. You're going to all these games and then you realize you get to sectionals and regionals and you're like, this is it. There, there will be no more of this after that. And I've been dreading this day for, for the Purdue, you know, now that he was able to extend his career uh, to, you know, play big time, big 10 basketball at Purdue university and not just be a part of the program, but be a big key you know, a player within the program and and watch his rise from, you know, being, you know, a smaller recruit, three-star guy to, you know, one of the leaders of this team. He comes out the tunnel first. He's announced last in the starting lineups. Uh, I I know I'll be uh, shedding a few tears tomorrow. I, it, you know, and, you know, because it just speaks to how hard you guys work for this and I can respect that, you know, and, and I think you and, and a guy like Sasha and, and all of them that have graduated and, and, and played at Purdue really are a standard that, that kids can look up to in a big, big way. And um, you got, you set the foundation. Now Sasha's helping continue that. And, and all those guys, Travion, Eric and Jared, and um, you guys have a lot to be proud of in that regard. But it's going to be an emotional day tomorrow for sure. And then we go on to the tournament where everything is just a pure stress mode. Uh, to close it out, you know, what are your thoughts on the Purdue season overall? You know, they got ranked number one early. They've been a top flight team. Jaden Ivey is an amazing talent who could be a top five pick in the NBA. They fell short of the Big Ten title. Uh, what are your thoughts on the season overall and, and what you think they're capable of now that we enter March and, and get into the Big Ten tournament? And then, of course, the the big March Madness tournament. And, and can this team get to their first Final Four in Purdue's program since 1980? Is it, Do you see that as a possibility? What are your overall thoughts with this year's team? Well, I'll start with uh... – I want to start with something that that I've thought for a while. I want to say that I told you so. <laughs> I knew I knew those guys were going to be great. I knew that they were going to be special. Um, uh, I just I had this gut feeling, and from watching those guys play, Jaden Ivey, Travion Williams, all those guys, their chemistry, Eric Hunter, on down the line, it's unbelievable. And now you got. A lot of those guys coming back, obviously going to have some key players leave, but some other players will step up in their role, and the cycle continues. Now, as for March Madness, I mean, anything is possible, right? You can say Final Four, it's possible. You can say National Championship, it's possible. It all depends on execution, commitment, and the ability to to step up and, and, and to play at a level 
that you didn't think was possible in the year leading up. You have to dig deep. You have to find that extra gear. You got to just go insanely hard. No matter how tired you are, you got to just lay it out every single day until that national championship ends. And, you know, that's just, that's the commitment. That's the nature of the March Madness. And um, obviously, as far as I've went, the Sweet 16, um, those guys know uh, a little bit more about the Elite Eight. Right. So they, they, they got one step further than I did, which I'm a little bit jealous of, but I'm super happy for them. Right. Anything is possible. Just please, Purdue fans, I see the negativity. Just just be supportive. These are freaking young kids, man. They're in college. Like they're playing as hard as they can. You know, just be supportive for these kids. Stop. Stop acting like you know everything that's going on, like with the team, and saying that you know that you know the defense is bad. Of course, the defense is bad in situations. Everybody has moments where they're going going to fail and they're going to make mistakes. They're young kids, right? Let them play. Let them learn. Let them grow. Let them be who they are. You know, and, and that's my message to the fans. Just just be proud of what we have and then just pray that we can go further you know like Absolutely. everybody everybody wants to see purdue wins and win a national championship everybody wants to see them make the final four it's possible it is but dude they're young kids even if they don't make it like they still got their whole lives ahead of them you know what I'm saying? They, they got an education to, to get they got you know for for the senior guys that's going to be their last time playing for purdue but they're really going to lay it all out there. They're not, they're, it's not like they're just sitting there going, oh, you know, I think we're just not going to play defense today. No, they're going out there and they're playing <laughs> as hard as they can. Sometimes they just make mistakes, right. you know, and it just takes, um, it just takes a lot of uh, composure to, t- to, to really take a step back and just appreciate uh, these guys and, and, and the dedication they put into the program. I can't agree more. You know, um, I've brought up a few different points, you know, um, like obviously, like I said, my personal connection to Sasha, you realize what's what's at stake for these kids every day they go out there, the pressure, you got draft, you know, uh, you've got NBA uh, scouts in the stands, you've got analysts, you know, deciphering every move you make, you, you, then when the game's over, you have homework to do on the plane ride home. (laughs) <laughs> you know, one time I'm I'm texting Sasha like, "Oh, get some rest." He's like, "Yeah, well, I got a lot of homework to do." You you forget that, you know. It, you know, it, 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 there's so much on their plate beyond just uh, living up to the expectations of the fan base. And then the other point I've always made on here: I'm a Cub fan, and when the Cubs won the World Series, that was the first year that whole year, and the year just the year prior were the first time the fan base had finally turned into a positive fan base. They weren't just killing the team on the field every day and being negative every time they went out there. Yeah, we'd we'd show up, but we were always a negative fan base by nature. And when that, that Cubs team that we finally felt like could be the one was there, the whole vibes at Wrigley Field had changed. And I'd never seen that in my life. Chicago can be a really tough town for fans. And, you know, that was the first time I'd ever seen a positive Cub fan base. And I really felt like that was a big key in them winning the World Series was all the positive vibes. The slogans fans are coming up with, we are good. And it is when they were down in the playoffs, people had signs that said, this is still happening. You know, they never gave up no matter how much adversity was shown. And that was the belief. And I do believe there's something to that that helps the you guys on the court, you know, and and as a fan, that's what this show's all about. Brags in the stands is all about the fans in the stands, and you got to do your part when you're at the games. I know it sounds hokey, but at the same time, it's the truth. As a Bears fan, when Cody Parkey double doinked off the field goal post, everybody in the stadium, you could feel it. Everyone was like, "Oh, he's gonna miss this," and he did. You know, ultimately, it's on Cody to make the kick, but at the same time. For him, 
when he goes out there and feels all this pressure and all this negativity surrounding him instead of encouragement, it affects how you play the game. And, and when the Purdue Boilermakers made that elite eight run, they went all they, their, their region was in Tennessee. So a lot of Purdue fans showed up for that. That was as raucous a crowd as you'll ever see, because they were finally starting to believe this is going to happen. And, you know, maybe they need to see a few wins in the tournament to get the mojo going, but they should just be behind the team from the start and let the chips fall where they may. I can't agree with you more on that sentiment, and I definitely want to, you know, finish there. A couple quick comments in the chat from Kirsten Ford. She said, we loved watching you play from third grade up. You made the Fords proud for your play on the court and the awesome man you are off the court. Uh, you that's know. a that's a childhood friend family right there growing up in from Pleasant Valley. So, and then Sally Smith, who commented earlier, is my my aunt. So Sally, Smith. at least at least I know that at least I know that you know my family and friends are watching. So yes. that's cool. Uh, uh, Lisa Beals put, "Hope your sister is doing well." I remember the service dog Purdue helped donate towards. Uh, Absolutely, and that's just that just goes to show more of what kind of people you know Purdue really is uh, having you know their back, and and I really do, I really do appreciate that, Lisa. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm I, I am proud of Purdue, and uh, I'm glad that I was able to give you something to be proud of. You know, it, it is it is special to me, um, but it's not about me. This is about these guys right now. Um, you know, these guys are, are playing out of their minds. Just please, please just remember their kids. Just just let them play. Let them play. Just be happy. Just be happy for them. And, um, yeah, I mean, and to, to comment on what you said, you know, positivity goes a long way. Absolutely. It's hard. It's hard when you get spoiled sometimes, especially when you get spoiled to being number one in the nation. There are some drawbacks. People start expecting certain things out of you. But when you get those expectations and you fail to meet them sometimes because everybody makes mistakes, people start looking down on you. It, there's just a lot of front runners in, in, in the business of basketball. And, it, and it's hard to it's hard to keep your cool and your mojo about it because you got your people that are always going to be there for you no matter what. And then you got the other side of it where it's like when things are good, things are great. And then you got when things are bad you know you start getting the side eyes you start getting the comments you start getting all those those um the that that feeling of negativity right and sure. um and that's just not a good way to be just remember that there's enough negative stuff that goes on in this world yeah you see it everywhere just just please remember that that you only have a short time on this earth just please be positive yeah no, it's the I only way you can look at life i think that's a fantastic message uh, to end with, um, you had a great career at Purdue. You you set the foundation for what we're seeing today at Purdue uh, University and the Boilermakers men's basketball program, reaching new heights this year, hitting number one in the country for the first time ever. And maybe they can achieve some other goals this year that haven't been done in a very long time. You're still uh, part of the Purdue culture with the men of Mackey. Are you going to continue quickly? Are you going to continue – uh, playing for the men of Mackey. I mean, we'll see. I, you know, I have some, I have some uh, NBA workouts coming up this summer. Um, I have some, some, some pretty cool stuff that I have lined up. But if, uh, if you know, if none of that works out, which hopefully it does. But if it doesn't, then, um, then absolutely. Like I, I don't see a reason why not. Like I, I mean, I love doing. It. I love putting on the gold black, even if it's you know indirectly. I think it's I think it's really uh fun to be a part of that and uh hopefully well, we get a lot of those guys sweet. back. You can get some more Purdue guys on on board as well. Yeah, well they're sweet jerseys. There's no question about that. Uh and I love this picture of you flexing on the sidelines there. So uh we're rooting for you, Isaac. You got a fan in me. Uh I will certainly be rooting for your uh NBA aspirations as you continue to to uh scratch and claw your way through the professional basketball circuit all the way out in China doing your thing and uh, gracious enough to carve out an hour of your time tonight here on Braggs in the stands. I can't thank you enough for that. Uh, and I know the people tuning in really appreciate that as well. And your, your insights you gave us. Yeah, no problem, man. Anytime. 
Well, don't don't say that because then I'll be bugging you all the time. Ask Bobby Riddell. He's he's stuck with me forever. So uh, I, I owe him some Cubs tickets for as many times as I've brought him on. But no, I appreciate the offer, and and I'm sure we'll take you up up on it on the future in the future. Yeah, um, yeah, bring it on, man. I got I got you know my mornings are pretty busy, but uh, the season's going to be done in about a month, so I'll have a lot more free time, so just hit me up anytime. Yeah, trying to figure out the difference between our 13-hour differences about melted my my caveman <laughs> brain, but uh, we got it all figured <laughs> out, and I appreciate you uh, uh, working hard for me to try to figure out a proper schedule, uh, and it's been a lot of fun talking with you tonight. Isaac, uh, thank you again for coming on, and, and best of luck with everything you have going on in your own endeavors. Yeah, no problem, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and uh, good luck to you guys in the, in the tournament. Good luck to Purdue, and we'll see what happens. Yes, sir. And as always, boiler up. Uh, we'll catch you here real soon. Yes, sir. Hammer down. Let's get it. Let's go. That is Isaac Haas uh, joining here at Braggs in the Stands. Really appreciate his time as he's off to a workout. You know, he had an interview earlier today or a meeting, and then he fit me in between his workout, uh, gave an hour of his time tonight. Unfortunately, Craig uh, Bowers wasn't able to make it from the Boiler Diehards Facebook group page and and a co-host here on the show. We've been doing a lot of these Purdue segments tonight, and uh, he, you know, being that we had to start a little earlier, uh, he was unfortunately unable to make it. Uh, we did our best to try to, to get him on as a part of this interview, but I uh, tried to hold it down for you guys here tonight. Uh, you know, um, we got some big games ahead of us. We've got some shows coming up next week. Uh, the hope is that we can maybe coerce our guy Sasha one last time here on Braggs in the Stands before the Big Ten tournament. Uh, I'll speak with him privately to see if we can work out a day, but I don't like to overload his plate because he's already got a lot of commitments uh, between what he does with his own Sasha Live show with Tom Brew and, and Sports Illustrated, and then, of course, practicing and studying, and, and then the tournament, uh, Big Ten tournament coming up quickly next week as they're obviously going to play starting on Friday night uh, You know, with the double bye, and we'll have to just wait and see exactly how the seedings are going to fall. It looks like they'll more than likely be the three seed, um, Illinois squeaking one out against Penn State last night. Uh, but that's, I don't believe, is uh, completely uh, hammered down, so to speak. Uh, so we'll know for sure. But it does look like that'll be the road is potentially Rutgers could be the first game on Friday. And then if they win that game, potentially Illinois. Uh, and if they could win that game, potentially Wisconsin maybe get some redemption uh, for Wisconsin beating Purdue twice this year. Very tough to uh, see Purdue fall short of their Big Ten title goals. I know how important that was to the seniors, Travion, Eric, Sasha, and Jared. You know, they watched Ryan Klein and, and Grady Eifert and those guys win a Big Ten title, um, you know, just a few years ago and wanted to continue to roll over that tradition as you, you know, you know, grow into your senior year and, and get one for themselves. You know, they were able to, you know, win the early season tournament when they beat North Carolina and Villanova. And, you know, you just kind of felt like, hey, one step at a time, win that tournament, then go on and, and win the Big Ten, you know, the Big Ten title and then go to the Big Ten tournament, maybe have some luck in there. Obviously, that's a crapshoot, you know, in a, in a three three day stretch. Uh, a lot of craziness goes down at the Big Ten tournament, so I, I expect nothing less that time. And then, of course, the ultimate goal, what everyone's been waiting for here uh, in Boiler Nation, and that's will this team go far in the March Madness tournament? Will this team make it to a Final Four? Can this team win a national championship? And I know, you know, as crazy as it seems with how successful this team has been and how talented they are, to a degree, it – for some fans, it feels like a disappointing season, which is kind of a shocker in a lot of ways, but it just goes to show you the difference in the level of expectations that this team has raised. Because how many times can you say a team that's 24 and six or whatever they are, and, and four of their six losses were by walk-off shots by the other team and 
and and some of them were bank shot miracles. I mean, it's taken so much for the teams that have beat them to beat them. Not only did Purdue not play well in, in most of those games, I thought Purdue played pretty well against Wisconsin, maybe short of the free throw shooting in the first half. Uh, but aside from that, defensively and, and offensively, I thought they did what they had to do to win in a tough environment in Wisconsin, and it just didn't get done. But in the other losses, they, they didn't play well, and they still barely lost by the narrowest of margins. I know for Purdue fans, that doesn't make you feel any better. You know, it, it, you're you're going to comb through every little mistake to say, well, if they did this right or that right, they would have won. And that's easy to say, but at the same time, you know, that's what basketball is all about. That's what sports are all about. You're going to win some, you'll lose some, and and sometimes the, the team on the other side who's trying just as hard as you is going to to come out on top, especially on the road in the Big Ten. That's how it always is. You see that across the board every year in the Big Ten and um, nothing different this season at all. So you hope maybe some of that bounce luck that Ron Harper Jr. and and, and Johnny Davis and, and um, um, you know, um, Chucky Hepburn had, maybe the, the, the good luck bounces will go Purdue's way in those tight games. You know, uh, you know, obviously Purdue's had some luck of their own in a few games. The, you know, um, you know, North Carolina State game comes to uh, NC State game comes to mind. Ohio State at home, you know, they they lost a big lead and took a Jaden Ivey three point shot to win the game. You know, at the last second, or they're going to overtime and maybe Ohio State pulls it out. Who knows? But they've had some bounces of their own. Not saying they haven't, but in their losses, they've had some really tough luck. So. You hope maybe the luck will turn back the other way. Uh, so as I said, we're going to do some shows next week. I want to, I'm want i definitely going to do a show depending on who the guest is, what players we can have on, maybe former or current, uh, before the Big Ten tournament. I want to bring on Brian Tonsoni, who was going to be a part of tonight's show, and then um, I just decided to scrap that and keep it to just Isaac. Uh, he does a great, you know, obviously is well known for, his IU podcast with assembly call. And I wanted to bring him on to kind of give him some shit back and forth about IU Purdue tomorrow. But uh, we can talk about the results of that game next week. And hopefully it's uh, good results for Purdue and bad results for Brian. So we can give him some crap after uh, IU kind of gave it to him, you know, in, uh, in Bloomington earlier this year. And then also he does great work for Delphi Bracketology, which is, you know, a, you know, um, it ranks, you know, that it's a mathematical system and they figure out who's making the tournament and what seeds they're going to be. And every year they, they, they have a very high percentage hit rate of getting those answers correct on where teams are going to fall. And so they do a really good job. If you don't follow Delphi Bracketology, you absolutely should. They, do weekly updates on where the seedings are currently. I believe right now they have Purdue as a three seed. So we'll talk to Brian Tonsoni next week, you know, after we see the results of the IU game and ask him where he thinks Purdue could potentially fall for the March Madness tournament. Obviously the Big Ten tournament will have a lot to be said about that. You know, in my opinion, if they can get to the championship game of the Big Ten tournament, I do believe they're still in play for a two seed, especially if they are to win the Big Ten tournament. You saw last year when Illinois won the Big Ten tournament, they were moved all the way up to a one seed, even though they hadn't won the Big Ten outright in the regular season. So there is, you know, as as tough as this week has been, first time they've lost two in a row all year. If they can do some great things next week against some very tough top competition, all of a sudden, the vibes and the feelings we all have could be completely different next week. And, you know, that just takes some execution and a little luck. So let's hope that they can do a little bit of both and get a little bit of the of the latter. And uh, they, they can still control their own destiny and get a quality seed. Now, if they were to lose early, that could change some things as far as where their seeding lies currently sits at three. So you you, you hope that they can win some games to avoid falling any further. Last year, they were a four seed and obviously uh, got knocked out by the 13 seed North Texas. Uh, so 
you know, I, I, it, it, we got a lot to discuss next week is basically what I'm trying to say. So we're going to do that show early in the week. A date hasn't been set for that yet. So keep an eye out for that. And then uh, depending on whether or not Purdue is in the championship game next week, I know I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but just for the people still watching that want to understand what the schedule might look like next week, I would like to do a selection Sunday show with a lot of different Purdue basketball, Twitter, personalities. A lot of my work is done on Twitter. For those of you that are watching on Facebook or YouTube, a lot of my coverage I put on Twitter. A lot, you know, the shows you'll always see across all platforms, but some of the little stuff, whether it's my opinions or little videos within the game or pictures is sometimes only shared on Twitter. So if you follow me at Braggs in the stands, or if you follow me on my personal page at G Braggs junior 23, you can find those things. Uh, so, you know, like I said, I'd like to do a, a selection Sunday show with some different uh, Purdue Twitter personalities that I've crossed paths with, with uh, maybe we'll make Bobby Riddell come on once again, always uh, pressure peer pressuring him to come on. So a lot of different things uh, that I'm keeping in mind and some more former players on the docket to come. We've had Isaac Haas. We've had Robbie Hummel. We've had, obviously, Bobby Riddell ad nauseum here on Braggs in the Stands, and we certainly appreciate all of his time that he gives to us here at Braggs in the Stands. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, I do want to thank, officially, Isaac Haas for giving so much of his time tonight. One hour. Uh, I know my buddy Kyle Lilly, who's in the chat, is um, probably laughing because I told him I was going to keep it short tonight. But the idea of me keeping anything short when I'm talking is damn near impossible. We're now hitting the hour and 20 mark. And I've been by myself talking to myself here on Braggs in the Stands. So uh, I think that'll about wrap things up for here. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, once again, I want to thank Isaac Haas uh, for coming on and carving out so much of his time. Uh, really appreciate uh, his thoughts and, I, and his final words about positivity. Really rung true for me. That's something I, I try to live by. It's you know, it's a, a daily grind to try to stay positive. And, and sometimes it's easier said than done. But as a fan, I, I you know, I, I, I typically veer towards, you know, the positive angles and looking on the bright side of things, even when things aren't going well, you know, and, and for me watching Purdue lose these last couple games, you know, when I watch them lose to Wisconsin and I watch the, the fans storm the court and they hoist the Big Ten title trophy, uh, the, honestly, the thing that I thought was they are ready for March. Does that guarantee they're going to get to the Final Four? No. But to be able to play in that kind of an atmosphere, which was as crazy as any atmosphere as they've played in all season, and I know the IU game at Assembly Hall and the Rutgers game at the Rack earlier this season were just as crazy, it was pandemonium that night. You had Barstool Big Cat shaking his belly and doing crazy things right behind the hoop. You had uh, Tim Hardaway was at the game. You had celebrities there. It was a huge game, and they're down 11 in the second half, and they could have easily laid down, but they have never, you know, aside from the Michigan game, which I felt like was from a fatigue factor, they've never let go of the rope all year. And to do that in that kind of an environment and Madison, in Madison, Wisconsin, you know, at the Kohl Center, it, you know, against the Wisconsin Badgers, it showed me – how ready this team is. Does that guarantee they're going to play perfect? No. Does There's going to be a game like that in the tournament. But all you can ask for is, will you keep fighting? And that's what they showed that night. They never let go of the rope. And, and, and they fought all the way back and tied the game. I think even at one point might have taken a one-point lead. <laughs> My head was spinning by the end of that game. Jaden Ivey hits a game-tying three. And then Chucky Hepburn you know, tosses one off the bank to win the game. I mean, you, you almost have to laugh at it at some point with some of the bad luck that they've had. Yes, Purdue put themselves in that position to lose like that, but at the same time, there's a lot of luck involved for Wisconsin being able to come out with that win. So love to be able to pay them back in the Big Ten Tournament Championship, but we'll see what ha what's to come next week uh, for Purdue. So that wraps things up finally here at Braggs in the Stands. Um but, uh, you know, thank you again for everybody. And keep on the lookout for some, uh, you know, announcements for shows coming up next week. 
We're going to be doing a lot of fun coverage here in the coming weeks here for March Madness. So uh, we'll see you. I'll be at Mackey Arena tomorrow night uh, or tomorrow afternoon for Senior Day. If you're in the arena, you know, and you want to come say hi, I'll be all over the place. I'm sure, you know, if you find me, uh, make sure you say hi. And uh, we'll be hanging out afterwards, you know, when the game concludes to to watch the seniors, you know, be, you know, um, you know, celebrated for the, the, the hard years that they, the hard work they put in all these years at Purdue University, Purdue University. So um, looking forward to that going to be an emotional day for everybody. Uh, so uh, looking forward to, to, to having those emotions. It's good to have, a, it's okay to have emotion. Uh, you know, I'm a crier, I'm a laugher and a crier. So I bring it all, I bring it all here at Bragg's in the stands. We almost got Isaac to cry a couple times tonight. So, you know, that's, it's an emotional show. What can I say? So, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Um, go Purdue, beat IU, finish the season strong, and then let's bring on March Madness once and for all. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great night, ladies and gentlemen. And always, 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 boiler up.